Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, we hope that you are all well, and thank you for joining us today for this webinar with Group 10 Metals. My name is Jacob Willoughby, and I'm a Vice President of Research and Analyst at Red Cloud Securities, Inc. Joining me remotely today is Michael Rowley, President and CEO of Group 10. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation from Michael, followed by a question and answer period. As a reminder, you can type in your questions at any time, and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can during the allotted time. But before we begin, uh, I have to go over the disclosures for this webinar. For Group 10, there may be some forward-looking statements made on this webinar, and I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of the company's corporate presentation, located on the company's website. For Red Cloud Securities, Inc., I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. Also, we note that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Please see our most recent research on Group 10 Metals available on our website, redcloudsecurities.com, by clicking on our research portal at the top of the front page. Red Cloud specific disclosures regarding Group 10 are as follows. In the past 12 months, a partner, director, or officer of Red Cloud Securities, Inc., or the analyst involved in the preparation of the research report has received compensation for investment banking services from the issuer. Also, in the last 12 months preceding the date of issuance of the research report or recommendation, Red Cloud Securities Inc. has performed investment banking services and has been retained under a service or advisory agreement by the issuer. And now, I'm very happy to introduce you to Michael Rowley of Group 10 Metals, who will give us a presentation about the company. Thank you, Jacob. Glad to be back. Um, shall we just roll right into the, into the deck? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with just a few slides on the market and uh, why we think this is an excellent time to be looking at precious metals in particular, also base and in particular exploration. Uh, I promise just a couple of slides. This one uh, looks at the ratio of commodities to equities uh, going back to 1970. So we're seeing the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index against the S&P 500 as a ratio. Um, and we see lows down to one uh, during the bubbles and then peaking at points of crisis. So most recently, coming out of the Gulf War, down to the dot-com bubble in uh, 1998, and then the global financial crisis in, in uh, 2009, we see uh, this ratio swinging from one to perhaps eight or nine. The key point here is that Commodities at present are very undervalued relative to equities. In fact, they're at the lowest point in the past 50 years. This is an excellent time to be looking at the commodity sector. Um, and I should give credit to Incrementum for this chart. Uh, these guys are out of Europe and we have a lot of respect for their work. If we look more closely at the sub-indexes within that, um, this chart runs from 95 to about 2020. And it takes those Goldman Sachs uh, indexes and uh, again, pairs them against the S&P 500 to look at commodity versus equity. Uh, in gold, we have the energy sub-index in green, the base metals, and in purple, the precious metals. And they largely track together coming out of 99 uh, up to the global financial crisis in 2008. And then down to where we are now with what the previous slide called the everything except commodities bubble. Um, the key point again is that they have a long way to go up and we're seeing precious metals leading the way there very nicely just in the last bit, just uh, last few quarters. And even base metals are starting to follow. So this is a very good indication that it's a good time to be looking at quality uh, mineral exploration stories. Looking at the, the precious metals prices going back uh, 40 years to 1980, we've got gold in the gold color, platinum in green, silver in red. And then as we look 
to the ratio of gold to silver in red and gold to platinum in green. Um, it tells a different story. We see um, those ratios peaking just recently. The ratio of gold to silver and gold to platinum are the highest they've been in the past 40 years. And this suggests we're at a major inflection point for these metals, that they, they need to revert to the mean and follow gold. Uh, gold is expected to go up. We expect silver and platinum to go up even more. In blue, you've got the peak in terms of those ratios, and that always marks the turning point, a major low turning point in the metal price cycle. And if you, if you look at the major high turning parts, that's always the opposite. That's marked by lows in that, um, those metal price ratios to gold. So the stage is set for a, for a terrific run in commodities um, led by precious metals. And we expect that the gold producers, uh, the balance sheets, the revenues they're generating now will bring the generalist crowd back in based on the strength of their results. And then that will ultimately uh, move through to juniors um, as, as part of the process. So group 10 metals, um, it's a very good time to be looking at quality uh, juniors. And we think group 10 qualifies in that regard. Experience management, technical teams, uh, lots of experience in what we're doing, including these exact rocks, also in building really good companies. Uh, we're in the Stillwater District as our focus, as you'll see here in a minute. And that is the highest grade PG producer in the world. Um, one of very few deposits outside of South Africa and Russia, and uh, one of the biggest and actually the highest grade. Uh, we've consolidated the second largest land position in that district. We have multiple targets across multiple kilometers. And our work has shown the, host, the potential to host multiple plat reef style deposits uh, within that. And that's based on this comparable setting uh, to the lower Bushveld complex, South Africa where we see the mines by Ivanhoe and Anglo-American. Anglo uh, our work um, in 2019 uh, proved that and uh, results are, are still pending from that work. Um, we have the potential to develop uh, mineral reserves, mineral resources at the five most advanced target areas. And uh, we'll be discussing uh, that shortly here. And it's simply an excellent district to be working in. Uh, existing infrastructure, uh, the deposits are near surface, and uh, this can facilitate the rapid development um, and reduced capital requirements. Our land positions, Stillwater West course flagship. We also have the Kluane PGE nickel co copper project in the Yukon, and a high-grade gold project in Ontario that adjoins 4 million high-grade ounces uh, by Treasury and First Mining. Um, we have 100% interest in all these assets. In fact, we're 100% owned on most of them and very close to owning 100% of the Stillwater project. These are all district scale assets. They were acquired during the bear market conditions at bear market prices. And they're all adjacent to world-class mines and deposits. In each case, we have a substantial database. We're bringing in a new geologic model and a world-class team. And that, of course, sets the way for, for world-class discoveries and a terrific uh, addition of value, creation of value. In terms of our market structure and capitalization, we've survived the past couple of months better than a lot of our peers. I think that's due to the strength of the balance sheet and the asset, the potential. Uh, we currently have 119 million shares out, market cap of about 24 million Canadian, and uh, just under 3 million in the bank. So we're funded and permitted to do what we need to do this year. Um, if nothing else works in the capital markets, we, we expect uh, to deliver. Um, management associates hold about 29% of the company, and we've seen that institutional base grow nicely. It's currently at 20% with U.S. Global, uh, along with Sprott Asset and uh, some more funds out of Toronto, Europe, and, and even Australia. Won't spend too long on the teams. Um, this is all available on the website, and I invite you to do a a deeper dive uh, on your own uh, time. Um, but I will call out Greg Johnson, our chair. Um, he's been working in these these rock types for a long time. And of course, he saw Nova Gold from 10 cents a share to 2 billion in market cap. So um, that's excellent uh, experience to have. I've founded the company. I've been with it a long time. And we recently changed our CFO, as you may have seen in, uh, in recent news. The technical team is world class. We were able to quickly attract Dr. Craig Bowe, who's an expert in these systems, and in fact was underground at Stillwater in the 80s, 
<clears throat> and we have Dr. David Broughton of Ivanhoe join the team in 2018. He, of course, was one of the co-founders of um, Ivanhoe's Flat Reef Deposit, and that was a, a major step forward for us to get that recognition validation. We've also brought together some of the team uh, from the juniors that gave us our database that were there before us, uh, and that's been invaluable as well. In terms of our target commodities, the Stillwater system is fundamentally a nickel copper sulfide system. Um, however, it is rich in palladium and platinum as it is known for worldwide. And we also see significant co-product value uh, in rhodium, cobalt, and gold. So it's worth noting that the US has enlisted a number of these commodities as strategic, and they're working to secure domestic supply of these things. We're, of course, in some of the best rocks in the world for these commodities. And uh, that happens to be in America, uh, in Montana, with three mines operating beside. So it's a very good uh, place to be. And this is considered tech grade nickel because it is nickel sulfide magmatic uh, sourced. <clears throat> in terms of outlook, um, we're bullish on uh, basically all of these commodities uh, going forward. Interesting to note that platinum uh, was tipped into uh, deficit last year by the investment demand from ETFs. So that's a very positive development in that regard. And that ties into what we talked about a minute ago on those um, those uh, market slides, commodity slides, with precious metals leading the way forward. Quick look at our land position. Um, we adjoin Sabanye Stillwater. Uh, Sabanye Stillwater, of course, created when South African gold producer Sabanye bought the Stillwater mines for 2.2 billion in 2017. We were making this acquisition at that time. Um, a local reached out to us and informed us that the um, the ground was largely available. Uh, that's Justin Madru shown there on our on our bios page. Um, he had staked some of the best parts and we worked with him to stake the rest. Um, and that followed a bankruptcy in 2013. Um, as a result, we have 100% interest on a large claim block. We essentially share the Stillwater Igneous Complex with our neighbor. Um, it's over 40 kilometers by eight kilometers of surface, layered magmatic intrusion. And it's similar to South Africa's uh, Bushveld, which is an important um, correlation we'll draw on here in a minute. It's known for the JM Reef deposit. This is 80 million ounces, uh, it's about half ounce per ton grade, palladium rich. It runs about three to one palladium platinum. Um, and it's already produced over 14 million ounces um, to date. Three active mines shown here, one in 86, one in 2002, and a new one in 2017. And they also run a smelter complex, uh, 60 kilometers to the uh, uh, north uh, east here uh, in Columbus, Montana. And that's relevant because it is uh, a nickel sulfide deposit, even though it's known for its palladium, the JM Reef is fundamentally nickel copper sulfide. So their operations are potentially relevant to us. Interesting to note also that uh, Impala Platinum bought uh, North American Palladium just a few months ago uh, for a billion dollars. So we're seeing a trend here of South African miners diversifying out of South Africa and into North American assets. There's a couple of pictures of the mines, two of the three. Um, we're very happy to be in Montana. Sabanya is the biggest taxpayer in the state. Um, these mines were deemed essential and have kept going from what I can gather full tilt throughout this corona uh, virus uh, turned down. Um, they are practicing social distancing and uh, they've changed the way the crews operate in cages and commute to site, for example. A number of the office staff are working from home, but from what I can gather, the mines are running full tilt. Um, and that's been very good for Sabanya, given that South Africa got, uh, got shut down at times there. Um, in addition, Montana, we've seen good movement lately. Um, the uh, Sandfire Minerals has now uh, has got a permit for their Black Butte copper project, which is a spectacular uh, grade underground copper mine. And we're seeing Rio Tinto move ahead with American Pacific at the Madison project, which is good to see. So we're, we're, we're bullish on the state. Quick look at geology uh, in order to set that Platte Reef uh, parallel. Stillwater complex is a layered magmatic system. The, the layers are visible up in the green portion. And that corresponds very nicely with what we see at the Bushveld. In fact, the two most active reefs, the JM and the Marinsky, <clears throat> UG2, 
are both about two point something kilometers up that layered system. In the lower portion of these systems, everything changes. The layers are obliterated and you get these big magma mixing events. And that's, that's the Platte Reef setting. That sets the stage for these much larger systems, um, net textured, disseminated, massive sulfides, uh, contact type deposits, um, intrusive dunites. So at the Platte Reef, we have Ivanhoe's Platte Reef Mine and uh, Anglo-Americans Mahalakwena Mine. Um, also not shown here is another Red Cloud client, the, um, the Waterberg Project of Platinum Group Metals. Um, the three of them total 400 million ounces, uh, tens of billions of pounds of copper and nickel. These are very long-lived and very profitable mines, and they get away from the very expensive, um, narrow reef-type mines um, that historically have dominated platinum and, and palladium production. Uh, at Stillwater, we've identified based on past drilling and the database, um, five priority target areas that we'll talk about, and three are shown here. These are the most advanced three, and these are the ones that we are advancing towards resources uh, right now. I've chosen the hybrid unit here because it's in that uh, intrusive dunite you see cutting vertically across everything. And then we've got the HGR and the Prototite zone and the camp, um, which we've put in the basal zone here. That's how that layered system looks at Stillwater. It's been tipped over by the mountains to the south to a very mining friendly angle. <clears throat> this means that the mineralization expresses its surface, which is different than Bushveld. And there we have the current mining operations and um, the reef type deposits that again are in the upper portions in green, narrow widths, three to 17 grams per ton PGEs. And that's typified by the JM Reef, the Marinsky and the UG2. Also our picket pin reef, which is shown there. Our focus is very much on the Platte Reef style deposits. This is what's attracted the interest of majors in group 10. And again, that's that potential for mineralization that is tens to hundreds of meters thick across kilometers in strike. Um, very amenable to bulk tonnage mining methods, whether it be uh, mechanized underground, such as uh, Ivanhoe is now putting in place at their Platte Reef project um brings economies of scale and we've again got those three uh, most advanced uh, target areas shown up top there camp hgr and hybrid we'll be talking more about those in a minute and again note that the hybrid unit is cutting across that as this um, proposed intrusive dunite like that soils light up across the property as as you might expect given that the mineralization is right there under surface in fact those nickel and copper levels as shown in that lower figure are tracking the prototype zone beautifully. Um, very high levels across very long widths. There's about 18 kilometers shown here. And we finished this survey to the west in 2019 and you'll see those results shortly. They continue that trend and there's some, uh, there's some new goodies in there as well. This slide presents a view of our uh, data compilation effort to date. Um, this happens to be Electromag uh, flown by Fugro, a digim survey. So the conductive areas are shown in purple. Uh, highest level conductors are shown in purple. And you've got historic drill holes. Uh, well, actually, not all historic. You've got our 2019 on there as well. Um, this is valuable information because it tells us that those conductors, the conductors are running copper nickel sulfide mineralization. So um, this is adding up very well. It's worth noting that the conductive highs have not been systematically tested as well. There are the six uh, reef type target areas uh, where you'd expect them to be on the upper portion of our main claim block and including the picket pin, which is above the JM reef in that layered stratigraphy. And there's the eight plat reef style, um, which we've uh, developed uh, working with the insight out of South Africa into these kilometer scale uh, domains of, um, and then overlaying that with drill results and uh, and also soil results so let's zoom in on the most advanced target areas this is the same slide basically but now looking at the uh the big three um iron mountain one of the three key most advanced target areas uh 24 holes define a mineralized zone across 850 meters of strike it's been tested to about 300 meters depth and we've got some beautiful intercepts shown there uh, we'll get more into those on the coming slide in 2019 we, uh, we drilled this and uh, also reassayed, relogged past core. 
and that was reported on December 18th. It's open in all directions. Uh, having a look at some of those drill intercepts, hole three in particular. If we, if we do a mining exercise here and we apply a half gram cutoff, um, we arrive at that 272 meter interval that's running nearly two grams platinum equivalent. That's a beautiful intercept, more than 500 gram meters grade thickness, one of the best hits ever in the Stillwater complex. Speaks to the amount of mineralization that's present. If we narrow that down and go for a one and a half gram per ton platinum equivalent cutoff grade, a more selective mining scenario, we have 141 meters that's running uh, over two and a half grams platinum equivalent. Um, and if you really go for grade, uh, 27 meters that's running uh, almost 1.2 grams 3E with nice nickel and copper on top of that, um, total grade thickness of 103 gram meters. Um, Ivanhoe's flat reef deposit is 26 meters thick at the point where that shaft uh, meets at 780 meters down. This is uh, something of a magic number here. We're seeing a lot of uh, 26 and 30 meter intervals that look very interesting. And I've highlighted this one um, for that reason. What does that look like in cross section? Um, this is what we do for fun back at the Korshak. We've compiled results here from the 60s and 70s. That's the 355 series holes that are shown. And a key point is that they don't have PGE data with them. Um, those are the two long holes there that simply have green base metal data and no red precious metal data. Um, then we've got holes from 2002 drilled by my team working for predecessor companies. And then our work just recently, um, long lengths lighting up with very good levels. Uh, there's that 272 meters at nearly two grams total platinum equivalent. And within that, there's that 27 meters and uh and and good supporting nickel and copper and, and even cobalt which they tend not to get in the uh in the bushveld we've also got some nice hits from 2002 higher up in the system and uh, we'll be following these up and going deeper on this side of the the north side of iron mountain as well um, all this is adding up very well to our target which is of course tens meters thick uh plat reef style perhaps 0.5% combined nickel copper, nice kicker of PGEs on top, uh, and rhodium assays, which we'll be following as well. Going back to that main slide and taking a look at the camp, um, the, similar to Iron Mountain, this uh, has a significant uh, drill database, and we were able to add that add to that with our own drilling in 2019. We reported that on January 21st. Uh, similar to Iron Mountain, there's a nice zone here that holds together in terms of continuity and grade. Uh, we drilled nearly 400 meters at 1.1 grams total platinum equivalent, and that starts at surface like we often see here at Stillwater. Within that is 62 meters of nearly 3 grams total platinum equivalent. Historically, there's a number of holes by AMAX that show 0.42 nickel, 0.23 copper, and we have very limited PGE data on that. And it's open in all directions. And a key point, I guess, is that lovely conductive high sitting just to the north of this known mineralized body has never been systematically tested. We're now permitted to go after that uh, in subsequent programs. I'm not going to do cross sections on camp. They look quite a bit like iron. I'm going to move to Chrome Mountain. This was announced uh, just uh, last week or so, April 16th. We didn't drill this ourselves in 2019. We had really good core to work from, from 2007, 2008. So instead, we re-logged and re-assayed. These holes were drilled for reef-type targets, and we basically brought them into the model, um, into that plat reef model. So we've got six holes that define a 200-meter thick mineralized zone uh, within a broad kilometer-wide area of uh, really good metals and soils. It's only been tested to 400 meters to date. 388 meters at a gram total platinum equivalent, with, again, that magic 30 meters within that that's running much higher. And then uh, in a second hole, uh, 118 meters at over two grams. And again, a lovely 30 meter intercept that's running uh, over three grams total platinum equivalent. Uh, we'll get more into those results. Um, in red here, showing that we've got multiple long intervals of multi-gram per ton uh, precious metals. Um, really good stuff. 50 meters at two grams platinum equivalent, um, 
I think I've got some arrows to draw this out. There's that one. Um, 30 meters at 1.25 grams palladium. Um, 2.6 platinum equivalent. And then again, in that next hole, 30 meters again, 2.2 uh, .2 grams. And then um, call out the uh, the grade thickness. These are these are terrific. There's a high level of mineralization here. These are some of the, the uh, longest and most mineralized intercepts ever recorded in still water. Um, anything above 100 gram meters grade thickness is, is considered exceptional. And we routinely get triple. And um, even as you saw at Iron Mountain, we go up to uh, five-fold that. <clears throat> so a lot of mineralization in the system here, and we are quickly um, zeroing in on those plat reef portions where it's most economic and most compelling. Cross sections from Chrome Mountain. There's that 388 meter intercept, and there's that 50 meter within that, um, and then 30 meters again uh, at to 1.25 grams palladium plus nickel, plus copper, um, more than half a gram platinum on top of that. This looks really good. You've got the hybrid unit shown in the mustard color, top right. And then in pink, um, that figure, which always to me looks something like a molar in a dental exam, that's the intrusive dunite target. And, and this gets very interesting at Crow Mountain in particular because we're seeing these on the ground. We're the first to go after them systematically. Intrusive dunites uh, historically have brought sometimes spectacular grades in the Bushveld um, and elsewhere in the world. They were the earliest mines, PGE mines, in the Bushveld, and the highest um, PGE assays ever returned in the world were from intrusive dunites uh, in the Bushveld. So we're excited to follow up on that. Um, in coming news releases, you'll see results of our of our rock samples uh, on these targets, and then we look forward to announcing our plans uh, going forward from there. So that is the three primary and most advanced target areas. We're focusing on these because we see great potential to add value here. Um, we expect to debut resources on all three of these this year. We're working on that now. Um, and we value the company around that. And uh, meanwhile, of course, working on, on less advanced target areas. Um, get to those in a second. It's worth noting that these conductive highs have never been systematically tested, these lovely purple areas that you see adjacent to these mineralized zones. Um, we are now permitted uh, for a five-year permit to step out from the past work and test these. And this is, this is huge. Um, everything we've done to date has been based on the past work, whether it's core that we have in the shack, the 12,000 meters that we have in our possession, or the 28,000 meters of data we have in the database, or the 1600 meters we drilled ourselves last year from from past drill pads everything has been influenced by those that past work this year we're free to step out and uh, really go after the plat reef model here we're excited for that earlier stage target the crescent area um lovely pge hits up there a number of holes over 25 gram meters grade thickness and five that are over 100 earlier stage, but uh, one that we've got simmering and we'll bring forward um, as that becomes, uh, as that develops. Uh, and then lastly, the, the pine shear zone in the Wild West target area, um, a north-south cutting uh, shear zone that's very high in gold. Um, and we'll, we'll feature that in, a, in an upcoming news release. We touched on this, I think it was January 2019, with the news release that we introduced the pine shear zone. We'll follow that up here uh, with some of our work from 2019, or from sorry, 2019, which uh, which gets very interesting, um, and we have some other notes as well on the gold story um, uh, developing at at Stillwater here. Uh, last point concerning this slide and targets is uh, Gold Spot and our work with them. Um, we touched on that in a news release at some number of weeks ago. We were very active in the core shack. Uh, through the first quarter of this year. And um, that work, uh, our team plus Gold Spot is bringing up some very interesting earlier stage targets across this property. Again, we've got 25 kilometers of, of the Stillwater Basal Zone here, and it's underexplored full stop. Um, and it's particularly underexplored for this Platte Reef style um, target model. So we're excited to be bringing this together uh, at the time that we are and with the database that we have. 
We talked a bit about the intrusive dunites at Crow Mountain. Um, it's interesting that this magnetic vector inversion model that we debuted last summer um, shows particular thickening of that magmatic system under Crow Mountain. It starts to look like a feeder system. This only reaches down two meters here uh, in this figure, but uh, it goes down much deeper under Crow Mountain. And that ties in possibly with this observation of these... Uh, potential intrusive dunites uh, at, at Chrome Mountain. There may be some later magmatic event here. It may be a feeder zone to the system. We don't know yet, but it's a compelling target. And to see the elevated PGE levels at Chrome Mountain um, is also interesting. Um, that thickening of magma, as shown here in, in pink, um, extends under all five of those target areas that we just saw in the slide a minute ago. So. We're wide open for expansion in terms of grade and scale laterally into those conductive highs, and then also at depth going down into, into the layers. Start to wrap up and talk about next steps. Um, 2017 was a big year, of course. We made the initial acquisition and promptly doubled the claim, uh, claim block as we got into the database and, uh, and the exciting targets that we were finding. We were able to attract a world-class team, and that includes the two figures you see here, Dr. Broughton and Dr. Bow at the core shack. And all that lovely core you see at bottom right, we were able to bring that into the model and start to go after things that hadn't been seen here before. Um, 2019 was a big year for us. We did our core shack debut at Roundup in January. Every major that you can name um, was there. Um, we were quite excited by the turnout. We did our initial block modeling of the most advanced target areas, uh, and we drill tested. We did our proof of concept um, at camp and Iron Mountain, and that brought some really good intercepts. Um, we relogged and reassayed past core. We completed ground programs, and we're working with Gold Spot. Priorities for 2020: the main one is to convert those mineralized zones into formal resources, and uh, we expect to do that this year. Uh, progress is good on those. We want to expand those known mineralized zones into the untested areas. Uh, we see great potential to uh, further build them out in terms of grade and scale. Um, and of course, we have uh, uh, a lot of targets we're currently identifying and prior prioritizing uh, our new targets. Upcoming news flow, we have re exploration results from last year still to be released. Uh, looking forward to getting those out. We are going to do a, a gold focus news release with some of the goodies that we've found in that regard. Also our rhodium assays. Um, not many projects have a rhodium aspect to them. Um, we do. We announced a, a nearly six gram rhodium grab sample last year at Iron Mountain. And um, we, we've got some good follow up to those uh, in coming here shortly in the next couple of weeks. Also, the results from our early stage programs, that soil uh, work and um, geological mapping programs. At some point, we'll also discuss metallurgy. Uh, AMAX gave us some very good uh, preliminary metallurgy work in the 70s, and that'll be the subject of an upcoming release. Um, we'll announce our 2020 exploration plans, of course, the block models in the most advanced areas. And lastly, we didn't really touch on it, but we have some really good secondary assets. Um, that are no longer our focus, uh, given what Stillwater is quickly becoming. And uh, we look forward to announcing possible deals on those. Um, in this gold market, that Ontario Gold Project is attracting a lot of attention. And we'd be glad to get some value for that. I don't think, uh, I don't think we're currently getting much value in the market for that. Uh, that's a wrap for me. Um, Jacob, I'd be glad to go to questions. Uh, thanks very much, Michael. That was very thorough. Uh, so I think um, <laughs> let's start off with uh, a question from uh, one viewer asking, um, with somewhat limited funding, um, how much drilling do you think that you could or would like to do this year? Well, we're funded to deliver what we need to uh, deliver on here. Um, we expect to deliver those resources, revalue the companies around that, and that in turn would allow us to raise bigger money at, at higher prices. Um, I wouldn't rule out uh, some sort of deal this year on the right terms as well, um, but we're mindful of dilution in terms of both the, the, the share structure of the company and also the project. Um, we see the way to add a lot of value here um, ourselves, just doing what we're doing. So we're going to stay the course. Um, 
I can't talk about drill programs yet for this year. We need to see restrictions lifted and we need to be sure we can move around. I want to be careful with that promise, but I think it'll be a, a great year following a great year last year. Um, we are funded in terms of what we need to do. Um, I think we could drill from our present uh, standpoint. We'll just see what the year brings as it unfolds. Okay, great. Um, could you maybe expand a bit about uh, the drill permitting that you mentioned? Um, when you're looking at some of those those uh, geophysical surveys, you can see those really dense purple areas haven't been drilled. And I know that part of it was that you were permitted to drill where past drilling had been done. But now, are you able to potentially go and, and, and drill a lot more of those, those areas? Yeah. Yeah, that's a big part of the story for the next few years. We're now permitted on, uh, I think it's almost 50 drill pads for five years, um, including testing those conductive highs, which have never been gone after systematically, which sounds crazy in such an iconic district. Uh, but there's great potential there. Um, re this really is just the beginning. I mean, the, what, the work that you just saw, it's largely brought together from drill holes that were drilled for other target types. It's remarkable that we're able just to do that. We're starting on second or third base here uh, with a really good model and a really good team. A uh, question from online uh, is probably worth a, a quick update, um, asking what is the, the warrant structure? Because I know you had a lot of warrants expire early in the year that brought in a, a fair bit of cash for you. What's the approximate warrant structure now? We're good. Yeah, that, that weight is gone and the, uh, and the cash is in, which is brilliant. Um, that's a big part of what's got us funded at present. Um, the current warrants are at 21 to 25 cents. And I think the total of them is about 20 million um, okay. aggregate between them. So that would bring in approximately a million. I believe the total would be more like five. Uh, oh, sorry. Am I math correctly? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, if we can hit those triggers, then we're funded uh, very nicely just with that. That's part of what the board is weighing right now. You know, we need to see what the market does in terms of funding. We've got some very big conversations underway. We've got some very big parties under CA. Um, it's, it's all good. We've got that interest. The pieces are there. We just need to uh, to be smart going forward with them. Right. And approximately how much time is on those warrants? Uh, when do they expire? They're pretty fresh. Uh, I think the earliest ones would be two years out for expiration. Okay, good. Um, just for everybody's uh, information, and Michael, I'm not sure if you were able to see it, but uh, we closed our poll about uh, precious metals upside, and uh, the viewers uh, voted more in favor of upside for platinum uh, to the palladium at uh, about 57% uh, platinum. Uh, not, not too shocking as, you know, platinum has been beat down for a while. It's only at about $780, whereas palladium is, is closing in on $1,900. But um, uh, I'd say that's positive because, uh, you know, it, it's, it's good that uh, they're kind of close. So even though palladium is at a high level, people are still expecting it to, to go a lot higher. Yes, right. I, I, frankly, I think it will as well. I mean, we've seen shutdowns in South Africa like crazy. Uh, it's actually, in terms of the economics of those commodities, it's worth noting that we've seen steady ongoing closure of South African reef type mines for years now, um, just sort of eroding supply steadily. Uh, that's going to drive platinum along with investment demand, which, which was over a million ounces last year, um, from ETFs. So yeah, palladium though, you know, car factories are opening up in Europe and elsewhere and, uh, and Anglo has announced that they're going to make what, two or 400,000 ounces fewer this year of palladium. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we noticed this morning that there was, um, stories out of South Africa saying that, uh, some of the major unions that handle the miners in, uh, the platinum mines have told their employees not to go back to work and, uh, it looked like platinum and palladium were up this morning, two or 3% on that news, because of course that's a very big pinch point for platinum and palladium. Absolutely. And it's supportive of that bulk mining model that uh, Ang Anglo now does at Mahalakwana. Mm -hmm. and Ivanhoe and, and Waterberg uh, are putting in place elsewhere on the Platte Reef. Um, right. So you, um, you touched briefly on the potential for divestitures, um, which uh, we've seen some companies um, doing more of recently because they're 
maybe not as able to tap equity markets right now. So divesting non-core projects has uh, has been a way for them to access access cash. I, I'm assuming that mostly you're referring to the Ontario uh, Northern Ontario gold assets there. We've had interest in all non-core assets, um, mm -hmm. even Duke Island, Alaska, which we tend not to talk about much, but uh, we continue to get interest in, in basically all of them. The key thing here is that these were all these are all good assets acquired when nobody wanted them, you know, during the bear market cycle, when you can pick up remarkably good projects for cheap, if you're prepared to hold them. And uh, quite often they revalue themselves if you don't do anything. Um, I think it's better to do some intelligent work and advance it and show a new model. Um, yes, the Gold Project Ontario, as you mentioned, that's the one that's leading the way. Um, we may well see a deal this year on it. Um, we're we're shooting high with that one. We don't want to do just sort of a, a junior deal. Um, we see great value there. I think ultimately that district will get consolidated into production. Treasury is now down the road, well down the road towards a mill. Mm. And uh, 4 million high grade ounces, as we mentioned, I, I think it looks really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a question from a viewer about the environmental permitting, which it's maybe a good segue to talk about some of the recent advancements in mining in Montana, which are very exciting. Yeah, I, the question specifically is about uh, permitting in Montana. Uh, environmental permitting is what's what's the difficulty or ease of, of getting it. Uh, we've we've had a very easy time getting permits in Montana. And there's a process, and you, and you do the process, and it's it's actually been very clear and and upfront. Um, we're only exploration stage, so. Um, there's a review and um, they've actually generally, in fact, every case I can think of, they've used existing studies, um, either filed by the juniors that were before us or or from Sabania themselves. So it's expedited the process and I think it's a very common sense approach for forestry to take that. We bond, we posted a 75,000 US bond to drill uh, last year. That's very typical of any other jurisdiction and uh, they've been great to work with. In fact, at the end of the process, they asked us if they given if they had given good service, which is not something I've had in any <laughs> jurisdiction. Um, it's fair to say that they're they're proactive in in uh, dealing with mining companies. We're in a very mining friendly district. Billing we we operate out of Billings. It's an oil and gas town. Sabania is the highest taxpayer in the state. The three mines beside us are run beautifully. Um, they recycle a lot of auto cats up at their um, Columbus facility, which brings a lot of, of positive feedback. It seems to be a very well run and very well liked operation. Um, and that's true of Montana in general. Uh, there are a number of other mines in the state. And, uh, and this recent uh, Black Butte decision was really good to see. That's a beautiful copper mine. Yeah, so Black Butte at one time was the biggest copper mine in the United States That's a long time ago, but uh, there's a company that got permitted to restart that. Yeah, that's uh, Sandfire, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you had mentioned to me that uh, Rio Tinto is doing some work in Montana as well now? Rio Tinto has been into the Madison project for some time, and that was Broadway for a while, and now it seems to be American Pacific, and it's it's going ahead nicely. And that's good to see majors uh, interested in the state and um, and getting involved there. As you know, we're talking to several majors at Stillwater. Yeah, um, they're quite clear with us, by the way. As a side note, that they just cannot find this kind of scale and potential anywhere in a jurisdiction they like. They want to see a forty-year mine life potential at a certain grade, and um, Stillwater seems to be ticking all the boxes so far. And to have Amax's work on metallurgy to give some preliminary answers there. Uh, helps a lot. Yeah, and to think that that work is 40 years old. I mean, there's been a lot of advancements in reagents and recoveries in, in sulfide, nickel, copper, PGE systems since then. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Now you touched on uh, rhodium assays as well. Um, I'm guessing that that's maybe something that could come out um, this quarter? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think roughly within the month. Um, we, we're sort of keeping our pace of news every couple of weeks. Whenever you guys call me and ask for news, I deliver. Well, if it's going to be within the month, that means before Friday. <sighs> well, sorry, within within a month. A month, uh, approximately. Uh, 
yeah. Uh, yeah, we 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 ran down it in the slides there, but uh, the gold news, um, rocks and soils, uh, rhodium, metallurgy, summy. We still haven't talked about the picket pin reef, you know, and I think that'll be the subject of a future news release, along with maybe a news release that just touches on all the reef targets that we have. Um, they're not our focus, but people are asking, and we owe them answers, and there's potential there. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, uh, that's a good point because it, it reminds people that uh, the, all the previous drilling that was done here was all looking for reef targets, never looking for plat reef style mineralization. So even though there's a fair bit of drilling, it was really focused on a completely different style of deposit. Yeah, it's actually not quite true. Amex was after um, the basal sulfide stuff, um, a lot of their work. Um, but that's true. They didn't have the Platt Reef model in mind. Platte Reef advanced sort of starting in 92 and really in 2000 when Ivanhoe got into it. Um, Amax was simply looking for 1% nickel and they were finding lots of half and 0.6. So they, they did some great work um, in the basal zone there, the sulfides. They never assayed, well, they rarely assayed for PGEs. And that's a key part of our story is that we're modeling that work plus the reef drilling that you mentioned. Um, bringing all that for the first time with this new insight from South Africa. And I think you mentioned, because there's a question online about drill plans, but you guys are still working that out and figuring out exactly where you want to go? Yep. Yeah. No, we're refining our targets and we're looking at our budgets. And really, we just need to know more about how this year is going to shape up on a few key factors. Mm -hmm. um, but we will be releasing that in news releases in the coming months as we get closer to... Uh, to getting out in the field. There's another question regarding the uh, gold spot collaboration you have. They're just sort of wondering um, how do those economics work? I mean, gold spot is working for you. Uh, what is, can you talk about the agreement at all? Yeah, they invested. Um, they invested net cash in us. Um, they loved the story. They were keen to show what they could do in an that was the last financing, sorry. Yes, it was, uh, I believe it was the November one. Um, and we've been very impressed working with them, I have to say. Some of us were skeptical, me included. Their materials are a little bit black box, I, you know, and I'm 52. I don't get this artificial intelligence thing. My son tells me about it. Um, Greg was a big fan early on. And uh, there were some other skeptics on the team as well. Those early meetings won us over. Um, and even what they produced in early January following their Christmas review, their first dive in the database. Uh, what they're turning up now is is really interesting stuff. And they're picking out some targets that we probably wouldn't have got to. Um, and they're, they're compelling. We look forward to announcing that. <clears throat> yeah, I've met with several companies that are doing collaborations with them. And the response has been uh, very consistent that um, people have been impressed and they, they think they're getting some really good information out of them. Full disclosure, I'm not sure. And um, I just like to thank uh, everybody for tuning in to participate, and especially thank you to to Michael for taking this time to uh, talk to us about Group Ten. Um, our next webinar is coming up on Tuesday, May fifth at uh, two p.m. That is going to be with Galleon Gold that uh, I will be hosting with the company's president, CEO, and chairman, David Russell which we're very excited about. That's a new company that uh, Red Cloud has uh, just begun dealing with. And uh, I thank you all and hope you all remain safe and healthy. And uh, we hope to all see you in person soon. Thanks all. Cheers. Thank you very much.